Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. Thanks for joining me. Um, we're here today to speak about some adventure Kevin Dubois and myself did to try to understand if this promising project based on serverless, in this case, key native, is um, actually something that can help you to achieve better coding in terms of sustainability, meaning and that's why we came out with this catchy name, so we could be accepted here at KubeCon and, you know, like, have fun. Um, Kevin, uh, unfortunately, couldn't come here, but I wanted to keep his name because we did this together and we had so much fun. Um, and I'm very grateful to be here at the city. I love it, not only because the very nice uh, sightseeing, but also other things. Um, so just a couple of words about myself. I work at Red Hat, uh, as many of you, uh, as a product manager in the area of observability, and um, mostly focusing open telemetry, distributed tracing, uh, cool stuff, actually. I love it. And I live in Madrid, in Spain. And apart from this, if you want to speak about programming in C++ or um, heavy metal or uh, sim racing, please do. Those are fun as well, so do that. And okay, so I, I was um, trying to find some uh, materials to kind of support why we are doing this, right? And I, in my past life, I did a PhD on uh, some physics stuff in which we tried to find new materials to make. Um, transistors that are more efficient, right? We all use silicon, but there are other alloys, uh, germanium, whatnot, and uh, we were doing this. So I was um, uh, watching some videos on YouTube, trying to search, okay, what can be supporting what I want to, to, to talk about, and then I saw this, this, uh, this uh, talk, which was great, very clever people uh, from IBM, MIT, Google, you know, like top people, and they were explaining how I miserably failed in my thesis, and everybody else as well, because our, um, the capacity to put more transistors uh, per area is not better, so we are not getting more efficient, and that has an impact on energy. So we are not getting more efficient, right? So we need to find other ways, not only trying to find new materials or new semiconductor structures, okay? And is this important? Well, recent research says that very soon we will reach our energy capacity. And that's kind of bothering, <laughs> right? At least if you want to, I don't know, I don't mean save the planet, we need to do that. But if you want to be more efficient, more sustainable, live in a better world for the ones that are coming later, um, there are some unexpected allies we can count on. It, not everything is about um, recycling. There are other ways, and those allies can help you by saving money, because energy costs money. So we will have these allies. We need to count on them, right? And just in case you want to sell, you know, across your area, like saving energy is also saving money. So CFOs in, in organizations are very, uh, are starting to be watching at this, not for these reasons, but others, right? Um, there was this paper at CNCF in which, because let, let's think how we can do this, right? Other ways. So there was this paper written uh, or published by CNCF recently, six months ago, um, about which factors are leading to overspend, right? And as I say, spending more money normally is kind of related with energy as well. And these factors are from over-provisioning. I know that <laughs> it's, it's very small, the, 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 the typography, but uh, uh, I will let you know, right? Um, so putting more workloads, you will need more clusters, more nodes, and then that means that you, you will be over-provisioning. I will explain that in a second more. Um, having some resources that I have them there just in case, 
that's also that lead to overspend, fluctuating consumption demands. Now I need these, but later I don't uh, need them. Um, and poor planning, right? That's planning how you deploy your things. That's something that is important. And why is that? Well, just the, if you see the amount of requests, if you try to paint the amount of requests you get over time, and try to map it against the capacity you have for that, that's what means provision in a cluster, right? In the cloud. So the amount of requests that you will have, it will vary. So at the beginning, you might have nothing. At the end, you may have a lot. And if there is a peak in which you didn't plan for it, for this number of requests, then you will have unhappy users. And you will have unhappy people, maybe you or me, trying to debug what's going on, right? Um, that's why it's important to try to not over-provision your clusters, but try to do it efficiently. And this is where serverless can help. This is one of the value propositions, right? Saying, OK, because how do you do this normally, right? You say, I put here my pod auto scaler, horizontal, that can help in terms of when I overcome this threshold of CPU consumption or whatever, then I put more pods, right? So I am able to, to um, uh, have, uh, um, uh, um, to give a service to this amount of requests. That's what you normally do. But this needs a lot of, uh, uh, you, you, first you need to deploy your stuff, so it's there, so you can measure, but then you also, um, uh, it, it will not scale to zero. And this is where serverless can help. So say, okay, uh, you're not doing anything, zero. And it's based on other kind of metrics, if you will. For instance, the number of requests, which is something we all can understand. Right? It's not only about CPU, the amount of CPU, which is just a byproduct. I'm interested in serving 2,000 requests per second. That's what I'm interested in. So with these values, without needing to deploy some other stuff, you are able to, serverless gives you the ability to scale based on those numbers, which are plain and simple, right? So this is what serverless can help with. And the project in the CNCF that helps for that is Keynative. We have great engineers from Red Hat and IBM and all over the world contributing to this great project uh, that brings these capabilities that I was just mentioning to Kubernetes, right? Um, it helps to, as I was saying, downscaling even to zero with the mechanism I was saying, and I will explain a bit more uh, how. Of course, it has load balancing because if you are scaling, it wouldn't be very funny if you still have the request going to the same pod all the time, right? So it needs to have load balancing, so that one is uh, great as well. And it kind of drives away the complexity of doing this for you. So you don't need to program programmatically be doing this, okay? But is it that simple? Well, as everything in life, it has some structure underneath that is doing some stuff. So if a happy request comes to your uh, cluster, uh, there is a router that, and this is just to sh share with you that it has this complex architecture going on doing stuff. So it has an activator that is able to check, do I have this thing uh, deployed? Uh, is the workload that is going to serve this request scaled to three, five, six, or is it to zero? Then it checks, then it's able to talked with, the, uh, with an auto-scaler and helped you to do that. And so you configure, say, OK, hey, you know what? If I have this number of concurrent requests, please uh, scale. And otherwise, you scale to zero. Or I want to always have one, uh, so leave it there. Another thing it can do is uh, this functionality that I needed to use. So I will explain it now. Why? That it's called uh, bursting. And it means that, you know what? If I have a lot of requests coming, just in the split of a second, let's just bypass all this infrastructure and just throw it to the workload that is running, right? Just in case you, you have more than zero, because if you have zero, then there's nothing to, nothing to serve, right? So with this explanation, one could think, aha, uh -huh, okay, you're telling me that 
if I am able to scale to zero, I don't have things running in the cluster, I am able to not over-provision, this means no power usage, right? <laughs> right. This is what we try to do, right? This is what we try to understand, right? Is this really helpful? Not. In which point it can be helpful? But you know what? How can we know? Right? We're like, how, how can we do this? Well, to measure is to know. We are advocating for observability. I have colleagues here who have been doing some time ago, or some, uh, a couple of hours ago, and uh, many of you as well, right? So this is where, just a second. I just added this slide and I forgot about it. <laughs> so I also wanted to give you this paper just to enforce this message that is important to measure. This is a paper uh, published uh, three years ago, maybe it's getting old, by Facebook, then now Meta, um, in is explaining in which layers we, can, we need to sp uh, spend research efforts to better use the energy and reduce our energy consumption. There are many layers that you can figure out, like, like in every uh, technology, right? Like uh, applications, you can do better applications, uh, runtime systems, compilers, better architectures in the circuits, as I was saying at the beginning of the talk, um, how the things are manufactured, and they overlap. If you help in one, you will be helping in another one. That's why this all this spaghetti thing inside. But all of them need measuring. We say, yeah, carbon aware load balancing, right? So based on the carbon emissions, I will load balance and move workloads. Well, for that you need to measure, because how are you going to do that, right? Um, energy minimization, the same. I mean, how, how can you know if you are uh, um, uh, uh, lowering your energy if, if you don't measure, right? And, uh, and so forth, right? So here, Kepler is when the project that comes to help. And Kepler, which I believe they spent some time trying to find very nice acronym. It's Kubernetes-based efficient power level exporter. So they, they made it, I would say, because it has a sun and an orbit, and I love that. I remember I studied physics. So, so what is Kepler? These, uh, all these words, what they say is that they help you to find a way to estimate the power consumption of your workload. And this is important. It's for the first time we are able to scratch the surface and say, it's not about measuring the energy that I, in the plug, right? Like, like uh, uh, on the, elect the electricity, which of course is important, but if you want to improve, if you, as I was sharing, in these layers, you need to measure, okay, this thing is spending energy, this thing is not spending energy, so let's f focus here, right? What it's using is using eBPF. And I will explain that a bit in a second. There was a better talk yesterday by one that <laughs> ran, so um, uh, ran away. Maybe it's because he doesn't want me to put him in the in the spot. Uh, but it, there was a great talk yesterday with uh, Daniel Mellado. Um, so it uses eBPF to collect energy, uh, and I will explain how. And and it's also um, mixed with Rappel, ACPI, Redfish, whatnot. So it it can uses it can use many APIs. And just for you to know where the project is, this is very recent. It was created as a collaboration of Red Hat Engineering Tech with Intel, uh, um, IBM folks, IBM Research, uh, and we are all there working, right? Uh, it was accepted last year as Sandbox. So there's a lot to do. Please get involved in the uh, community if you want this project to thrive. And how does it work? Well, you have your process, right? I do my Hello World application or my very complicated calculus application that is able to do 2 plus 2, and I want my CPU to compute that for me. Well, what you do is you call the kernel, so the kernel calls the CPU, says, can you do this uh, operation for me? Right? So eBPF is this great capability of installing custom programs, which are called 
kernel programs into the kernel that are able to kind of step in and do a stuff normally in parallel, just, just you, you don't want bottlenecks there. And the thing we will do is to take note. Okay, so you're telling me that you want to do 2 plus 2. Okay, this is this process ID, and with this uh, group ID, and I spend this, C this many CPU cycles. And I do this for everything running in my cluster. So I am able to map who is guilty for every uh, CPU cycles, or catch misses, and whatnot. So I take note. So, okay, this is one part of the story. Please, let's just store that for a second. We will mix it just in a bit. I have that information. And the other, on the other hand, Intel launched Rappel. Rappel is this capability, you know, Linux files. So it writes into files um, the amount of energy that the system is consuming, right? And it's uh, divided into CPU, RAM, and other uh, uh, core components, right? Okay, so it didn't take too much time to say, if I can have these programs doing this, like taking note of the CPU cycles that every program is, do, is, is consuming, and I have the ability to know the amount of energy that my CPU is, uh, is consuming, let's put them together and expose them as Prometheus metrics, because cloud and, and observability is great, right? So this is what they did. And how? Well, with ratios, right? If I know that this guy has spent these many CPU cycles, and I know that this guy has spent these other ones, and then I can add it up to 100%, I can say, OK, this percentage of energy is yours. And you is the one you need to, to be um, uh, improved because you are being greedy, right? So this is the idea under Kinder. At the end of the day, what you will be doing it's just deploying your pods that are in some namespaces that will call the underlying stuff, right? That, that's what you do when you deploy your own applications. And Kepler will be installing those programs that will be in the middle and exposing those metrics to Prometheus so you can watch them in a great uh, and nice Grafana dashboard or whatever. Right? So this is what we can do with Kepler, right? Just to understand, how many of you knew Kepler? Can you raise your hand? Yeah, I know some of you. You don't know? Okay. Thank you. Okay, so maybe now you know a bit more and maybe it triggers some ideas. So it just to also trigger some ideas that you can play at home or at work, I will tell you how we use this to measure if serverless can help or not, right? First of all, cloud native or distributed systems. Okay, I have a traffic generator written in C++ that is able to send a lot of requests per second. Great. I have, at the other side, one mock that is a server that will be saying, thank you very much, 200 for you. Okay, that's like the typical hello world, but at a scale, right? Like, like thousands of requests per second. And because I want it to scale, because I want to put some load, I need some pods, right? Not just one but the scaling. And I don't want to do load balancing by myself because I love modern observability and CNCF projects. So that's why I put Istio in, the, in, in between. And what Istio does is installing some sidecars that take this, uh, do this for me. The load balancing and everything they know. So I just throw my service into a service mesh and it works. This is what we will call deployment one. And just to understand how many requests I'm, s I'm sending, is this working or not, uh, does it make sense? I instrument my application with open telemetry, metrics, logs, and traces. And in this case, I will send my metrics to a Prometheus via an open telemetry collector. So many CNCF projects, check. And then, of course, I install Kepler to watch and send the stuff to Grafana so I can understand if uh, things are, are well or not and take my, my measurements. OK, deployment number two, serverless. This is what we are here about, right? Serverless. Um, in this case, I don't deploy my server mock. I deploy my traffic generator and key native saying, OK, when you receive traffic, you scale this for me. And the, same, the, the rest is the same, right? So deployment one, regular with just the service mesh. Deployment two, key native. 
and I need to run a bit. Uh, okay, uh, so this is the, the, and this is what we will do. And just because I want to measure, I just create a cron job that is able to deploy this thing for 20 minutes, generate traffic, turn it down. Wait 10 minutes, and then deploy, uh, uh, send traffic to deployment number two, and uh, so Knative does its thing, and I measure. And then I create a great Grafana dashboard, which I will explain. Don't be, uh, so here, at uh, the top right, I'm checking which deployment is running. In this case, it was the serverless uh, the, at that point in time, and I have 2,000 requests per second, uh, but that's not interesting for us. What's interesting for us is, thanks to Kepler, I could get the energy consumption. So here I have actually the power, which is, and here is the energy of the two namespaces. Energy is a, a, a number, and um, power will be energy over time, right? Uh, which is this one in watts. And I was very happy because I could tell my friends that were helping me from the serverless Knative team, this is great, there is this change in energy. But then I looked at it and the green one, or the greener, was serverless. So serverless is spending more energy than the other one, which is the server full, we call it. And then I was not that happy. I also found out that here, which is these 10 uh, minutes that I have in between, well, 20 actually, yeah, 10, uh, there was an idle consumption for the serverless one, for the serverless uh, uh, deployment, right? And then I said, why? And that's why I created this other panel, right? This other, um, and then, it, which is a breakdown of the power consumption just for serverless deployment. And the total is the red top one, and this is just the contributions to that line, okay? Okay, so it seems that my deployment is spending the same as serverless itself. How useful, right? Uh, in the, for, for this, right? And then, in this case, for the service mesh, the service mesh namespace was not contributing, it was just everything that was deployed. But that's okay, because what Istio does is deploying uh, Sidecar containers together with my containers, so they are in my namespace, so they are there with me, right? So, okay. And then if you do this like for three, six hours, it's the same, it's consistent, just to let you know that this is not just one thing I did for a second and, and, and whatnot. Um, here, it's just a representation just for you to know that is CPU, RAM, uh, um, contributions to this, and just to let you know that I didn't find any difference between the two, right? Just, just uh, I, I wanted to check. So this is what I found, just uh, uh, a summary of it. So then I started thinking, but what if I don't put Istio there, just for starters? So I added deployment number three, which we call plane. Just for you to know that deployment, deployment number three, which is this um, uh, blue line, doesn't consume a lot, of course, because I don't have Istio doing things for me. It's not doing load balancing. I just have client server, so mm, kind of makes sense. Um, so the energy of serverless in this case is greater than serverful, which is greater than plain. And serverful is the Istio one. Okay. So I was very frustrated, and then I started to say, okay, okay, just add load, add load, whatever. Let's see what happens. Let's play with this parameter, concurrent con uh, concurrency, uh, container concurrency to eight. 4,000 requests per second, what if we tune the stuff, uh, what if I use this burst parameter that will allow me to um, uh, jump over Knative without Knative doing things, just to let you know that the results were the same. Okay, so I wasn't really happy. But then I called Kevin. Right? He, I, I was doing this with Kevin Dubois, this guy, and he programs in Java. And I program in C++. And he started asking me, but is your application doing something? And I was like, it's doing something, but it's C++, so it's very efficient, right? And, and they, I will do something. And I was like, yeah, let's do, do, do something. You can do something because, and it's Java, and it's going to be not efficient, right? But he told me, it's Quarkus. And I said, OK, but Quarkus is very efficient. Well, however, yes, I, I am kidding because I, I love C++. I don't want to start a war in languages, OK? Uh, I'm just kidding. Java is actually very uh, efficient, right, in terms of, of uh, energy consumption, just for you to know. 
For memory, we all know, you know, garbage collector. Uh, we know the best, but just for you to know, that, that's funny. So what we did was recreate very efficient code that you normally find a Friday before deployment, you know, like this. Can you review this pull request in which I am putting all of this information in this string and then throw it out? You know, it takes a lot of, uh, it will take a lot of CPU and memory and, and everything, right? So we did that. And then I was happy in the end because we could, ah, by the way, it was spending that much that um, it couldn't, um, it was spending that much uh, 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 CPU that we couldn't have it um, have more than six requests per second. If you watch here my, my open telemetry metrics, just six requests per second. But just for that, we were spending the same energy or more energy in the server full than the server less, right? So this tells us something. And in this case, the key native was not contributing a lot. Uh, so the energy, OK, I will slow down. <laughs> and the energy um, um, for the serverless deployment now was more or less the same that the server full. It was not double, right? So, and, and, and of course, greater than the plain one. And this one was negligible. And this means, or, or the lessons learned here, and I will explain that more now, is that it depends, right? If, if you ask me, is serverless powerfully powerless? It's not about serverless, it's just it depends. Just imagine, but I, and just let me try to explain this concept. We were talking about over-provisioning. So this is how it looks in real life. In real life, if you look at the left uh, one, you will be requesting a lot of empty space so your applications can scale. And that will be there. And by the minute you reach the limit, you will ask your IT guys for more clusters. Um, and you will provision more nodes. And you will do that and do that and do that. And that's where this can help because with serverless, you have like these things running, but you know, I don't need this anymore. Zero. Now I need more. I deploy them, right? And this is where it can help. Oh. And the animation goes and goes. So, conclusions. And maybe you were excited because you thought I was going to say here, yeah, serverless is going to save the world. Well, it can, but you need to measure it. You cannot think. So every time anyone comes with this bright idea that will save the world, whatever, yeah, but measure it. That's so. so more importantly, first of all, adding stuff is not just magic. It needs to do its thing, and it consumes CPU cycles. It consumes energy. It's just about what is this thing done for. In this case, Istio was helping me a lot for the load balancing, so that was nice. But it was also consuming energy, and I could see that, and I could see the amount of energy that is consuming. And serverless was too, was doing that too. So in that case. Serverless was not helping. I was fine with what I was. I didn't need a big cluster. I didn't need to scale. So I was good. That's the important bit here. There is also a constant power consumption in the background. Right? And things are not really linear. Again, measure, right? This is what I, if, if, if you want a word as an outcome from my talk, measure. And Kepler can help. Um, the, the energy, I rushed that a bit, but it's not linear. So the energy that serverless was consuming for six requests per second is not like a lot less than the one that is spending processing 4,000 requests per second, right? So that's, that's, in, that's why it's important to measure. Also, what your application is doing matters. Guys, don't do this kind of pull request of uh, processing uh, um, uh, strings very inefficiently, and I will get there in a second why uh, this can be important as well. And again, one size doesn't fill all, right? So, um, for future work, I would like to, and maybe you can do it, or maybe you can experiment with that if you want, 
I would like to um, test with real use cases, see how this helps with scaling nodes, which is where the real power consumption decrease will come from. And um, I would also like to thank you very much the um, great team working. Now, Roger, you are taking over. Uh, Vibu Prasar, he was helping me a lot, so I need to thank him publicly everywhere I go, but also the, the, the Kepler community. Uh, please go and be involved in it if you find this interesting. And also the Kinerif team, which were discussing with me, like, hey, Jose, don't be so frustrated. This is nice. This is not bad. You can scale nodes, and that's the real power consumption where it comes from. So, and another one, just imagine, just for the future, right? Just imagine implementing this. And this is what I love the most, m m most better than saving the planet. Just imagine a pull request, right? That, like the one I showed you. And instead of fighting for tabs versus spaces, I don't like these if else statements, I want them in one line, I want them in 5,000 lines, I don't care. Just imagine telling to your peer, how dare you, right? So thank you very much for attending. And if you have any questions, let me know. You are, did I get that um, if users will be able to use Kepler to uh, decide to use serverless or not, or key native? To deploy, sorry. Oh. Yeah. OK, if you should, uh, uh, without deploying several instances or several kind of deployments, if you will be able to, to uh, decide. I believe yes, because it lets you know the, the, what the, the main point about Kepler is that it gives you the granular consumption, the, the granular information. That means that you can point fingers and you can check the amount of energy. So that, that's a great question. Actually, you don't need to compare. You can check. OK, I am spending this amount of energy. Where is it coming from? So if serverless is neglectable, or neglectable in your, in your uh, case, yeah, you, you know it, right? You know that it will not. Uh, so yeah, I, I think so. Another question there? Uh, come again, sorry. Profiles like I don't really know if Kepler can could use profiling as data. So I, I'm repeating this for the understand. <laughs> I, I don't know if it could use profiles. Um, today is so much based on eBPF that getting the information from other places. I don't know if you could have CPU cycles that granularity from the profiles. If you can have it, I guess yes, there could be a, another uh, a project trying to investigate that. I don't see the, the, pro the Kepler project uh, running there because it's just the foundation. It's so based on ABPF. But that could be interesting, yes. I don't know. Not in Kepler. I don't see Kepler, but maybe others. Thank you. Yes, so th th there's a comment saying that uh, using ambient mesh in instead of just uh, sidecar based uh, service mesh would be amazing. Yes, that could be another talk that we can submit uh, to another. Uh, let's, let's do that. that. That would be nice. Yes, I think that would be great to understand. I don't know if it will collide with eBPF and we would need eBPF man uh, to handle that because that would be more eBPF, but I don't know. But yeah, that's be inter interesting. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks.